Hello, and welcome to ASE's webinar series. I am Kat Lyons, ASE's Healthcare Education Manager. Today's webinar is entitled, Recommendations for the Adult Cardiac Sonographer Performing Echocardiography to Screen for Critical Congenital Heart Disease in the Newborn. I'd now like to introduce tonight's speakers. Melissa Wasserman is the Satellite Operations Sonographer Lead at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and focuses on pediatric echocardiography outreach at CHOP-affiliated community hospitals and outpatient centers. A member of ASC since 2006 and FACE since 2010, she has served on the ASC Council on Pediatric and Congenital Heart Disease and is the incoming guidelines and standards representative to the Cardiovascular Sonography Council. Dr. Bruce Landeck is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and practices at Children's Hospital of Colorado. He is the lead education attending physician in the Echocardiography Laboratory and is Medical Director of the Cardiac Progressive Care Unit at Children's Colorado. He has been a member of ASC since 2006 and a FACE member since 2013, serving on the guidelines and standards, finance and membership committees, as well as on the Pediatrics Congenital Heart Disease Council Steering Committee. Without further ado, Please welcome Melissa Wasserman and Dr. Bruce Landek. Thank you, Kat, and thank you to the ASE for inviting Dr. Landek and me to be here today. We have no conflicts of interest. So let's get started. If you are here today and you're an adult sonographer that's being asked to scan newborns and you're not completely comfortable doing so, you're not alone. This is a hot topic for a reason. So much so that at the ASC Council Retreat in 2019, this subject was brought up independently by both the Council on Cardiovascular Sonography and the Pediatric and Congenital Heart Disease Councils. Why? So in 2011, the CDC included checking pulse oximity as part of the newborn screening. If the newborn fails, the screening, an echocardiogram is mandated. Now, there are a lot of hospitals with labor and delivery departments, but there are not a lot of hospitals that have pediatric sonographers or pediatric cardiologists on site. Therefore, there's an increased ask of adult cardiac sonographers to scan newborns. And so many have expressed concerns about missing critical congenital heart disease. It's a sonographer's worst nightmare to miss something critical. No one wants to miss something. And so this is exactly why the councils decided to make these guidelines a joint effort between both the sonographers and pediatric community. And so I also wanna take a minute to thank the ASC for inviting us to do this webinar. Um, you know, this is a real uh, this is a real stress for some of our adult sonographer colleagues. Uh, we have a crying child who is very difficult to console, is moving around, um, is very small, very different from your day to day work uh, working on uh, adult patients. And we have sonographers who are scared, and they uh, feel like they're doing this because their administrators are making them do it, and they're not trained to do this, and so. Uh, they are very nervous about putting their neck out there and trying to make diagnoses on things that they're not comfortable with. And there's very real fear about this, but uh, we don't want you to worry. We want to be your resource to help you uh, serve this uh, very important patient population. So the idea was introduced in November of 2019, and we spent over a year working on this guideline. We asked our adult sonographer colleagues what they're looking for as far as guidance in this subject. Do we teach about specific forms of congenital heart disease? Do we only show adult imaging views or should we include pediatric views? We thought about how we could make the most positive impact on patient care through these recommendations. And in March of 2021, our guideline recommendations for the adult cardiac sonographer performing echocardiography to screen for critical congenital heart disease in the newborn was published in JACE. And one really nice feature about this guidelines document is that it really highlights the contributions of our sonographers. Uh, Melissa is the first author on this guidelines document. And we have three other sonographers, Elaine Shea, Courtney Cassidy, and Rita France, 
uh, all of whom contributed significantly to the uh, document. This is really nice to see that a majority of the authors of this document are sonographers, um, just exhibiting further a great collaboration between the two councils. We think it's important to clarify what this document is and what this document is not intended to do. So it is not intended to replace the role of pediatric sonographers. When available, experienced pediatric sonographers should be your first line to scan pediatric patients. Cardiologists, pediatric cardiologists are best to interpret pediatric echoes. Um, this document is also not intended to justify asking adult cardiac sonographers to scan newborns. It's also not going to teach adult sonographers every single form of congenital heart disease or how to perform a complete comprehensive pediatric echocardiogram. But what this document will provide are imaging clues, red flag findings, tips and tricks to guide adult cardiac sonographers when they're asked to scan newborns. So we asked ourselves, how can we assist sonographers in identifying when congenital heart disease is critical, even if you're not able to make a specific diagnosis? First, we should all become familiar with the pulse oximity screening CDC critical congenital heart disease targets. There are only 12 of them. They're listed in our document and they're listed again later in this webinar. Also described in our document are specific echo findings for these forms of critical congenital heart disease and which imaging windows you'll see them. We try to show as many examples in parasternal windows as possible since this is the same in both pediatric and adult echocardiograms. Um, additionally, there are not only still frames, but there are all, also moving AVI files available on JACE, so sonographers can actually access them bedside. So if you get called to the nursery and you're unsure of what you're looking at, you can pull these videos up on your cell phone and you can compare it to what you're seeing in the patient that you're currently scanning. Um, with this in mind, we encourage an if-then type of thinking. So if we can't get a perfect candy cane in supersternal view, then this patient might have interrupted aortic arch. If we see a small rounded left atrium and there's right to left atrial shunting, then this patient might have total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Really, before we get into some of the um, lesions and describing uh, the different features of those lesions, we wanted to highlight another important part of this document, which is describing the infrastructure that's needed at hospitals uh, where the echocardiograms are gonna be performed um, and also at the location of the interpreting pediatric cardiologist to have a good uh, seamless way to transmit these studies, perform the studies at the right uh, level of quality. So we described the need for age appropriate echocardiography equipment, including uh, neonatal ultrasound probes, a mechanism to store and transmit those images electronically. And then uh, we described the need for a structured communication process among the referring provider, the sonographer, and the reading physician. And we don't uh, describe exactly what each institution or each uh, relationship between hospitals needs to look like, but really just uh, highlight the importance of having a process and developing that with your uh, with your uh, hospitals that you work with so that you can do things just as easily in the middle of the night as you can during the regular workday. So let's start with instrumentation and patient settings. This is so important because before you even start your scan, you want to give yourself the best chance of obtaining beautiful diagnostic images. We recommend using a mid to high frequency transducer if a high frequency probe is not available to you, you should use the highest frequency available on your adult probe. Most of them have a range of frequencies, so go to the highest one that you have. Make sure you're optimizing your frame rate. I highly, highly recommend this. Newborns have very fast heart rates, so a slow frame rate can really diminish adequate visualization of anatomy. Also important with such high heart rates is an EKG. 
An EKG allows us to see what's happening physiologically during a specific part of the cardiac cycle. And sometimes in pediatric patients, that's difficult to determine just by watching the echo without an EKG. Your patients should be kept warm and happy. A calm, content baby will give you high quality images. It is hard enough to scan anatomy and physiology that you are unfamiliar with without a patient screaming and crying and kicking. Learning to swaddle a baby is a highly recommended skill. Um, swaddling not only keeps your baby warm, but it also limits their freedom to hit you with their little arms and legs, which these babies are strong. If you have a gel warmer, use it. I personally recommend wrapping gel in a towel to keep it warm until you get to the nursery. So if you take it from your lab, wrap it in a towel, it'll, it'll hold the heat. If you have a sleeping baby, cold gel is a sure way to wake them. A sleeping baby is a gift. Um, also, there's no need to have your baby completely exposed from the waist up. Unless they're under a warmer, I, we recommend only exposing um, the imaging window that you're using. So you don't need the chest exposed if you're doing subcostals. So to store and transmit these images, really this needs to be uh, electronic or in the 21st century. Uh, we used to use videotape for those of us with enough gray hairs to remember, but uh, we do this electronically now. And uh, there needs to be a sufficient bandwidth between sites so that studies can be transmitted quickly and reliably, uh, regardless of the time of day. So both sites will need to involve their IT groups to do some testing and make sure that there's a uh, nice way to transmit these images. Some institutions like to do real-time interpretation of neonatal echocardiograms. Others uh, store and then forward to the other institution, but if you are going to do a real-time interpretation, obviously we need the images to stream with a sufficient speed to play in real time and be at an adequate frame rate. There's, um, there's the potential for error if the images come across choppy or fragmented. And then certainly you want to have uh, available previous echocardiographic data images uh, reports uh, and have that retrievable for comparison. So if you're the interpreting site, you want to be able to hold on to those previous studies so that when you're doing a uh, recheck on a baby with a PDA, for example, who's on a ventilator, you can compare the size of the PDA and the size of the heart to the previous study you've performed. And please keep in mind that uh, the primary responsibility for storage and archiving these studies does rest with a performing facility. So a structured communication process is going to include uh, some data that will help the uh, interpreting physician be able to do an accurate interpretation. Some of that's going to include demographic information, certainly the indication for the study. You want the patient's height and weight, and that allows for accurate z-scores, which is how in pediatrics we uh, look at the size of structures and adjust that for the patient's size. Uh, we wanna have a concurrent systemic blood pressure uh, whenever possible in order to get an accurate interpretation of pulmonary artery pressure in a comparison to the systemic pressure. And then certainly the desired urgency of interpretation is this one that you want the report the same day. Do you want it within a couple hours or do we really need to drop what we're doing and open up that study immediately? And then finally, you have to have contact information to be able to contact the ordering provider. And so in the document, we describe this and we really uh, focus on the uh, need for a two-way communication. So we know that some sonographers that are not as experienced are going to be really nervous about performing these studies. We really wanna break down the walls of communication as, as much as we can and allow for these sonographers to be encouraged to reach out to the pediatric cardiologist reading the study and ask questions before, during, uh, and or after they've performed the study. This two-way communication and feedback will really help the sonographer feel more comfortable performing these studies and will also improve their quality of imaging. Not to mention it helps the physician know what the sonographer was thinking when they go to make their interpretation. And Dr. Landak, the other thing that I would like to add to that slide is that 
also a sonographer reaching out to a pediatric sonographer at the interpreting site can also be helpful. So even if there's not a pediatric cardiologist to speak with at that moment, speaking to a pediatric sonographer can also help and guide that sonographer through the study that they're doing. Absolutely, that's a great point. So specific imaging recommendations. Everyone, no matter who they're scanning or what type of imaging they're doing, should follow a protocol. It doesn't have to be complex or anything they're not comfortable with. And really an adult protocol can be the baseline of scanning your pediatric patient. Um, however, it can only help to learn non-standard pediatric views and sweeps. It will help you to not miss a diagnosis. Um, it'll help the interpreting pediatric cardiologist. Even if you don't know what you're looking at with these sweeps, the interpreting cardiologist will. Um, and the more you do them, the better you'll get at obtaining them. On JACE Online, we've shown the recommended pediatric echo views. We've shown both the echo and my hands on an actual patient demonstrating exactly where the probe placement should be. And also my wrist motion. So you can see not only the echo image, but how exactly it was obtained. Um, unlike adult echo, where short, concise clips are used, we recommend deliberately long clips of data where complete sweeps of the heart are used. We recommend starting with the heart off the screen and ending with the heart off the screen so that you know that you have swept through the entirety of the heart. We wanna see a standard parasternal view, a posterior tilt and an anterior tilt all in one clip. This helps demonstrate relational anatomy. Again, even if you're unsure of what that anatomy is, showing a sweep will help the reader see what's anterior and what's posterior because your most anterior great vessel isn't always your, your pulmonary artery. Emphasis on subcostal views. Again, the more you do them, the better you'll get. So feel free to practice these on your adult patients. Why do we love subcostal views? Because just like adults with COPD, newborns can be born with lung disease, which makes parasternal and sometimes even apical imaging difficult. Subcostal views are free from lung artifacts. Also, most newborns are not born with rock hard abs, uh, like some of our adult patients. So they provide really beautiful echo images. Um, they also allow for optimal interrogation of outflow tracks. And we're gonna show that to you later in this session. And again, just becoming familiar with telltale signs of critical congenital heart disease that we show in this document will help imaging. Ideally, even if you're not able to specify the type of critical congenital heart disease encountered, the sonographer should be, be able to recognize red flag findings. And I remember when I first started scanning, I went to the NICU and the patient had a double outlet right ventricle but I didn't know it was double outlet right, right ventricle. It looked like to me, they were two aortic valves coming off uh, the right ventricle. And so I called my attending and I said, I think you have to come down here because this patient has two different aortic valves and they're both coming off the right ventricle. So again, you may not always be correct, but if you're able to identify these red flag findings, you'll ultimately help, help in patient care. All right, so why don't we transition now and get into some of these congenital defects. So as Melissa mentioned earlier, uh, we have a table in our document that indicates some of the uh, CDC's targets for a critical congenital heart defect uh, in patients who fail pulse oximetry screening. And I don't need to read all these uh, here, but you can see what these are. The document will get into uh, some of the key findings for each of these different defects and what uh, some of the if-then scenarios, if you see something abnormal, think about this type of disease. And so uh, we'll refer to that some in this talk. And for further information, please check out that document. So how do we approach this? I like this table. Um, I think most sonographers, adult or pediatric, are familiar with the descriptions and structures demonstrated in these standard views and sweeps. What I feel like is most important in this table are the imaging tips in the last column, like paying attention to where your index marker is because the cardiac apex is not always to the left, or taking the time to hyperextend the baby's neck to obtain suprasternal images by placing a roll towel under their shoulders. It'll add an extra 30 seconds to your study 
but it will dramatically improve your suprasternal imaging. Another one is not going directly near the xiphoid process when obtaining subcostal images. Sometimes they're not the clearest. Sometimes you can improve your image quality by actually moving further inferiorly and slightly, slightly rightward um, using the liver as your acoustic window. So we want to give examples of red flag findings in critical congenital heart disease in standard adult echo views. And I think most cardiac sonographers are gonna walk away from this webinar feeling like they knew more than they even realized. So for example, here's a parasternal long axis view. To the left, we see side-by-side -side great vessels. We don't normally see both vessels in the same plane in a parasternal long axis view. So there's your first red flag. Also, the posterior great vessel appears to bifurcate like the pulmonary artery. Again, we don't normally see that in a parasternal long axis view. Normally we would have to angle anteriorly to see the branch PAs. So that's your second red flag. To the right, we see a parasternal long axis view of a patient with cetralgia fallow. Again, we see the aorta is overriding the ventricular septum and the septum appears to come to a blunt end. Both of these are red flag findings of Tetralogy of Fallot. Here we see a parasternal short axis view. To the left, we see no moving leaflets where we normally see a pulmonary valve. So there's a red flag finding of pulmonary atresia. And to the right, we see what appears to be branch pulmonary arteries arising from a aortic valve. This is really a truncal valve in a patient with truncus arteriosus. Ultimately, as a sonographer, you should be able to recognize that this is not normal and warrants contacting your pediatric cardiology colleagues. Here we see an apical four-chamber view of a patient with hypo hypoplastic left heart syndrome. I did this, we did this uh, clip on purpose. Notice the image to the right, I have it oriented in an adult echo fashion with the apex on the top of the screen. A lot of adult sonographers tell me they lose their bearings when they're trying to obtain apical images in pediatric patients. So our advice is to essentially cheat. Get your image the way you're used to in an adult orientation and then flip it before you acquire the image for your pediatric cardiologist to read. So here we can see a big size discrepancy between the two ventricles. That's your red flag finding that this patient may have hypoplastic left heart syndrome or pulmonary atresia, which is normally associated with a hypoplastic right ventricle. Ultimately in this image, what should stand out to you is that there's a size discrepancy between the two ventricles, even if you can't figure out which ventricle is bigger and which one is hypoplastic. Here's more apical views. To the left, we see a patient with a huge right atrium and almost no right ventricular cavity. This huge right atrium is a red flag finding for Epstein anomaly. You can see that there are tricuspid valve leaflets apically displaced. And to the right, we see an apical view of a patient with a single ventricle physiology. We see two AV valves leading into the same ventricle. Again, as an adult sonographer, you may not be able to say which ventricle that is, but you'd definitely be able to recognize that there are two inlets to one ventricle, and that's what you would convey to your breathing cardiologist. So again, I think adult sonographers coming out of this webinar are gonna realize that they would recognize more than they previously thought they would. Here we see our standard candy cane view of the aortic arch. Um, only in 2D, we see that it tapers near the isthmus. And when we throw color Doppler on, we see that the flow aliases. I've seen this in adult patients. So this is not just something that we should look for in scanning newborns. As I said earlier, we are huge fans of the subcostal window. And this is the same view that we use in adult imaging to look at the atrial septum and to look for pericardial effusion. 
It's a subcostal frontal sweep. We, uh, what we also see here as we continue to angle anteriorly is that both great vessels are arising from the right ventricle. So this patient has double outlet right ventricle, DORV. If you were scanning this baby and saw no great vessel arising from the left ventricle, but two coming from the right, that's a red flag finding that this patient has double outlet right ventricle. And just uh, going back to that to bring this talk full circle, uh, notice the perfect angle of uh, interrogation to Doppler these outflow tracks as we angle anteriorly. We are completely parallel to flow with both outflow tracks. All right, so we have another table in the document that goes over some of the non-standard views. And these are ones that you may not be completely comfortable doing, but we'll demonstrate with the uh, videos that are associated with the document how to perform these views. And this is where we think this uh, guidelines document really shines. We've got tremendous online uh, material that is associated with the document. So if you are on the JACE website looking at this document, you can click these links for the videos and be able to actually see these sweeps being performed or these views being performed uh, with narration on some of them that will show you how to identify structures. And so a few of them that we like to look at in pediatrics that we don't always do in the adult cardiology world are the subcostal short axis view, the ductal view where we isolate the ductus arteriosus from the branch pulmonary arteries and from the aorta, and then the abdominal aortic view, which allows us to see pulsation of flow in the abdominal aorta, uh, which is abnormal if you have an upstream obstruction, such as coarctation of the aorta. One important finding, and we'll talk about this later, is that uh, when you're looking at the abdominal aorta in pediatrics and in neonatal scanning, we like to uh, sample by uh, spectral Doppler the abdominal aorta itself and not the superior mesenteric artery or celiac artery because those can be confounding when you're interpreting this and they can mimic what a coarctation might look like. So these next two clips are some of my favorite in the document because I remember when I was learning peds and someone told me to sweep from left to right, I moved my entire hand with the probe from the patient's left to the patient's right. When we say sweep, we mean with our wrist. So here we see a subcostal short axis view. You can see where I placed the probe on the patient with the index marker at six o'clock. And just from this one sweep, there's so much we can see. We can see both the IVC and the SVC entering the right atrium normally. We can see the aorta in its entirety. Even We can even see the arch descending aorta just from this view. Um, from valve to arch to descending aorta, we can also see that the ventricular septum is nice and round, which goes against this patient having pulmonary hypertension. So from this one view, we can get so much out of it. Um, and with color, this would also be a great view to look for ventricular septal defects. Here we see a ductal view. It's not a perfect high parasternal because we're focusing on isolating the ductus arteriosus. So in order to do this, we must see the main pulmonary artery, the left pulmonary artery, and the descending aorta in one view. So here we can see the probe placement and the corresponding echo image. Um, when we have a large PDA, it's sometimes referred to as a three finger view because the right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery, and PDA look like three fingers pointing downward like that. And here's the abdominal aortic view. And to get this, we want to really try and get as parallel to the direction of flow as possible. And what that means is that sometimes you need to go very low in the abdomen and then aim back up toward the head. And doing that, you'll be able to get a better alignment of the flow in the abdominal aorta. We then get a pulse wave Doppler at the best angle possible, trying to get as parallel to our imaging beam as we can so that we can get a good Doppler signal. Now we're not worried about the peak velocity 
of flow in the abdominal aorta, but really we just want to see the shape of the waveform and really see if there's any kind of uh, diastolic flow continuation, which can be seen in coarctation of the aorta. As I mentioned, don't sample this, the SMA or the celiac artery. Uh, even if you do that in some of your adult protocols, it really doesn't offer much in neonatal scanning and it can mimic a coarctation. So it can be a false positive. And here's a, a sample showing a, a normal Doppler pattern in the abdominal aorta, you can see a nice brisk upstroke here and really very minimal, if any, flow during diastole. Uh, compared to the image on the right where a patient has coarctation, you can see that it's a more blunted upstroke. And then during diastole, there's this slow continuation of flow all the way until the next systole. We call this a sawtooth pattern. And this is indicative of an upstream obstruction such as coarctation of the aorta. So if you saw this type of pattern, Number one, make sure you're not in the SMA or celiac, but number two, this is a red flag finding of a coarctation. And there's a few other important things that we wanna talk about. And uh, these are not all necessarily in the, uh, the table one of our document, which is the uh, critical congenital heart defects, but it is something that you're gonna be asked to do pretty routinely in neonates, especially if they have other types of non-cardiac diagnoses. Uh, so arch-sidedness is a very important thing to be able to do, and we'll talk about that. Uh, pulmonary veins can be challenging for the adult sonographer, and uh, we will talk about how you can get pulmonary veins in very nicely. And then finally, coronary arteries, which uh, to be honest, have very little to do with neonatal heart disease, but is more important in the era where we're seeing uh, MISC as a complication from patients who've had COVID-19, as well as in the patients who we suspect may have Kawasaki disease. If you can get better at imaging coronary arteries, that's gonna help these patients potentially get treatment faster uh, and also rule out some of these conditions uh, where we may be able to avoid having to transfer the patient to a pediatric center. So arch sidedness, um, this is defined by the relationship of the aortic arch to the trachea. And so most of us have a left aortic arch. That's the, the normal finding. And that's where the aortic arch courses to the left of the trachea and over the left main stem bronchus. Some people have a right aortic arch, which courses to the right of the trachea and over the right main stem bronchus. What's important is in a neonate who has uh, tracheoesophageal fistula, in order to get the repair done for their TE fistula, they're going to need to have a lateral thoracotomy performed by the surgeon. And so it's very important to make your incision on the opposite side of the aortic arch on the chest. If a patient has a right aortic arch, you don't want to make your lateral thoracotomy on the right side because the aortic arch is going to be in the way, preventing you from being able to see the TE fistula. That would be a big no-no. The surgeon would have to close up that incision, go to the other side and do a left thoracotomy in that case. So getting arch sightedness is something that's really crucial. And there's really two methods that we use to demonstrate arch sightedness. The standard method that we prefer in our lab and in most labs is gonna be a suprasternal short axis image. And what we'll do is you'll have your indicator at three o'clock, you're up in the suprasternal notch and you wanna identify the aorta, which is a circle in this view and have 2D and color Doppler and slowly sweep toward the head. The first branching vessel will almost always go to the opposite direction of the arch. And so if the first branching vessel goes to the patient's right, then it's gonna be a left aortic arch. Sometimes this is difficult to do and you need a backup method. And so a backup method that we'll use is in the suprasternal long axis. We'll have the indicator at 12 o'clock and we'll do a right to left sweep. And it's very, very important for this sweep that you label on the screen, you're doing a right to left sweep. And so what you do is you start in the right axilla where you don't see any vessels. You wanna sweep slowly across to the left axilla. And in the middle of that, you're gonna see tracheal rings. And this might take a little practice and you might have to um, work with your pediatric cardiologist or your pediatric sonographer to see what tracheal rings look like. But once you've seen them, you'll know what to look for. If you 
are sweeping right to left and you see the trachea and then you see the arch, it's a left aortic arch because you've gone from right to left. If you see the arch and then the trachea, it's a right aortic arch. And if you see the arch and then the trachea and then you see another arch, that may be a vascular ring, uh, which uh, could be a double aortic arch. And that'd be a really good pickup if you were able to make that diagnosis. And so just showing that short axis view, we've got our indicator at three o'clock here. And if you look at the uh, sweep on the left, as it plays here, you're gonna see the aorta as a circle and you're gonna see the first branch head off to the patient's right. And then it's gonna split into two vessels and that's gonna be your nominate artery, which is going to split into your subclavian and your carotid. We like to put color on as well because we see the pulsatility of that and that helps us make sure that these are arteries that we're looking at and not veins. There's obviously a lot of vascular uh, structures in this area and so we wanna make sure we're imaging the right thing. And so this would be a classic sweep for a patient who has a left aortic arch with normal branching. Pulmonary veins. We're spending a lot of time on the suprasternal view. Uh, pulmonary veins, they are also demonstrated in the suprasternal short axis view with the indicator at three o'clock. And you would just aim your probe inferiorly from the notch. Um, you are looking to see that the left atrium tapers in its cor corners. Um, it's called a crab view which is four views draining into the left atrium. And it's called the crab view because uh, if you can envision a crab with its claws up um, and legs down, the claws up would be the upper pulmonary veins and the legs down would be the lower pulmonary veins. Um, if you put color Doppler on, which you should, it's important to remember that you have to lower your Nyquist limit. This is, these are venous structures. This is venous flow. And if your scale is at 140, you're not going to see anything coming through. Um, so a low Nyquist limit, lower your scale, make sure in 2D that we see the left atrium tapers in its corners. Um, a helpful hint is that if you can't see the pulmonary veins well, look at the atrial septum. If there is any level of atrial shunting and it's right to left, if it's right to left and the left atrium that you see is small and looks more like a circle and does not taper, then you should begin to suspect anomalous pulmonary venous return. So here's that suprasternal view, the suprasternal short axis to the left in 2D. We see the left atrium and we can see those arms and legs of the crab, the uh, upper and lower pulmonary veins. And then to the right, we have put color Doppler on and we see that that scale is lowered to 63. And we can see blue flow for the upper pulmonary veins going away from our probe and red flow for the lower pulmonary veins coming up toward our probe. Right, so coronary arteries, this is not in the document, but again, uh, something that you may be asked to scan. Um, this is not necessarily going to be part of the neonatal protocol that you and your um, interpreting uh, partners are going to have. But in older kids uh, who might have suspected Kawasaki or MISC or chest pain with exertion, uh, you may be asked to scan these patients. And in the world of congenital heart disease, the standard burden of proof for coronary arteries is a very high bar, very difficult to achieve. Uh, we want to see the coronaries in 2D and color Doppler to see the origins of the left and right coronary arteries from the aorta. This has to be a moving video clip, no still images. Uh, we have to see it in motion uh, as people uh, might know coronary arteries tend to fill more in diastole than in systole, and so you really have to um, have a moving clip here. Um, again, this is very difficult. It requires a lot of practice to gain competency. Our sonographers at our lab uh, do this every week. Um, almost every day they're, they're doing it uh, on patients with Kawasaki um, or following up those patients, as well as just screening in patients with chest pain. And so 
practice makes perfect. If you have the opportunity uh, on a patient who's an adult who may have great uh, parasternal windows, go ahead and practice looking for the coronaries on them and then you'll feel more comfortable when you're asked to do it on a fussy 18 month old who's had fever for a week. Or even we have a lot of patients that are referred to pediatric cardiology because they had originally gone to an adult cardiologist because they are 17 and they had chest pain and they didn't have their coronaries imaged. And now they're coming for their second echocardiogram. So when we're talking about patient care and you know appropriate use criteria, if you can obtain coronaries in your teenage patients with chest pain, you should try to. Chest pain is an indication to look for coronaries. Um, and also, for the record, I scan coronaries every single day and the right coronary is still sometimes difficult for me to see after 17 years of scanning. So it's not easy, but the better, the more you do of them, the better you will become. Um, so some scanning tips for coronaries, we look in parasternal short axis. Um, to help bring out the coronaries and decrease the amount of gray scale you have, we recommend lowering your compression so your whites will be whiter and uh, the black will be darker. And we also always recommend um, moving clips. So here we're showing still frames just for measurement uh, reasons. To the left, we see the left coronary artery. We can see the left main coronary artery and it bifurcates into the left anterior descending and the circumflex. And here we're measuring the circumflex. To the right, we see the right main coronary artery. And again, you can see us measuring here for um, Kawasaki disease or MISC patients. And here's that moving clip that we so recommend. Uh, to the left in 2D, you can see the right coronary artery coming off around 11 o'clock and we can see the left coronary artery coming off between three and four o'clock. And when we put color flow on, just to make sure it's real, we like to show it in 2D and color we can see the red flow going away from the aorta and feeding the myocardium in diastole. Um, another thing just to pay attention to is the color scale. We lower our color scale to fill our coronaries. Um, again, it's not gonna fill if you have a, a scale, a color scale of you know, 110. So, um, however, if you lower your scale too much, all you're gonna get is you know, crazy amounts of color. So I recommend, we recommend lowering the color scale until we can get the coronaries to fill and then stopping. And here we see that same image, that same 2D image to the left where we're concentrating on the right coronary artery. And another um, takeaway for coloring and demonstrating coronary arteries is to look how small the color um, sector is because we want as high of a frame rate as we possibly can get. And we're lowering our color scale, so that kind of goes against it. So we want to keep our, um, our color sector as small as possible to keep our frame rate high and so that we can actually show the coronary filling. And again, look at um, to see that there is an EKG tracing because this will also help us show when that coronary is filling to make sure that it's filling in diastole. Our big takeaway is that if you can't make it look normal, it probably isn't normal. So coronaries can be formed anywhere. Um, and if you can't get the right coronary at 10 or 11 o'clock, maybe you should look at one o'clock and see if there's anything coming off there. Maybe it's not coming off the aorta at all. Maybe it's coming off the pulmonary artery. So if you can't make it look normal, it might not be. That certainly holds true for all congenital uh, heart disease. Um, you'll run into patients in, in the adult congenital heart disease world with CCTGA, and in those patients, you cannot make them have a normal parasternal long axis view. It's, their anatomy just won't allow for it. So summarizing our talk, uh, you know, we have a new guidelines document which really aims to assist the adult sonographers screening for congenital heart disease in the newborn, particularly critical disease. 
We have 35 video clips included on the ASC web version of the document. So please take an opportunity to look online and look at some of those video clips. Uh, we really strongly encourage a two-way structured communication to allow for the proper care of these patients and also to give feedback to the stenographers um, and let them describe what they see, what they can't see, what they're thinking. This is all gonna help this patient out um, if you can have a two-way communication. There's very non-standard views for the adult sonographer that we have in this document. We want you to get familiar with that. Get familiar with doing sweeps, nice, slow, deliberate sweeps, 10 to 20 seconds long. And if you're struggling, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call your friendly, friendly pediatric colleague. And that can be the, the pediatric sonographer, the pediatric cardiologist. We want to be available to you. We want to uh, help you feel more comfortable scanning these patients because ultimately it's gonna help us make better interpretations and it's gonna uh, provide the best care for these patients. And again, like Melissa said, if you can't make it look normal, it probably isn't normal. And so with that, we're going to take a few questions that we've had from the audience. Okay, so here's one question that says, sometimes I'm only able to fill the coronaries with color in systole, is that okay? Why don't you no. take that one, Melissa? <laughs> no, that is not okay. Um, we want them filled in diastole. What I do find though, is if they are filling in systole, it means that your scale is too low. So you can increase your scale and also you can mess with your color gain um, because they should never be filling in systole. You want them in order to prove that the, that's where the coronaries are, they need to fill in diastole. Yeah, and we've all been tricked by this reading studies. Um, you, can have, uh, you can have some fluid outside the heart and the pericardial reflection in that area that looks like a coronary and it fills with color and you think that might be your coronary origin. Uh, and so really seeing it in diastole is gonna be the key there. Um, another question, uh, and this is, this is a good question, uh, it, you know, brings up sort of the point of this whole document is, um, should we be doing these echoes in the first place if we're adult sonographers? Um, and, and I think the answer to that is, um, Yes, you should. You should get comfortable doing this. If there's something that you struggle with or that you have a fear of, I think taking, tackling it head on is gonna be uh, the best way to get past that fear. You know, what we're trying to do here is not have you go outside of your scope of practice to become a pediatric sonographer, but rather we're trying to help the patients uh, get the right care at the right time. And so if you scan these patients and you can get comfortable uh, getting some of these views that we're talking about, you might be able to make the diagnosis quicker for the patient, which helps them get better care or get the intervention they may need. You may be able to prove that their heart is normal and they get to go home instead of being transferred to another facility where we then do the echo and say, actually, there's no heart disease here. So uh, I don't know, Melissa, that's, I, I think it's, it, it's something that everybody should get used to doing. I fully agree. I think that, as I said in the beginning of this talk, there are way more institutions with labor and delivery than there are with pediatric cardiology. So um, ultimately, I think everyone, every adult sonographer is going to end up having to scan these newborns. And, you know, we all went into healthcare for our patients because we care about our patients. And if you can help a newborn baby get the right diagnosis quickly, then you just improve patient care so much. So I don't think it's a question of should you or should you not. I think ultimately uh, the majority of places are doing them. Um, and this will be a way for you to just really improve patient care and patient outcome. And, and, and if, like, as Dr. Lanzak said, if you can prove that that patient does not have heart disease, think about how much stress you just saved those parents of a newborn baby who's being told that their baby has to have an echocardiogram. Yeah, and one other thing I'll mention, um, and this is actually something I heard from one of our co-authors, uh, Rita France in Kansas City, is 
the idea that if you're scanning a patient and you put the probe down and you see something is not right, and you don't know what it is, but there's just something that's not right about this, go ahead and do a couple slow sweeps and then pause the study for a minute, call the pediatric lab that reads studies for you and say, I'm not sure what this is, but there's something not right. Go ahead and send those clips over. And then while you've sent those over, you can go ahead and start uh, finishing up the rest of your scan. And that allows the interpreting team to look at the images and they may be able to recognize right away, you know what, this is transposition of the great arteries. This patient needs to get transferred and they'll go ahead and initiate that process to speed things up for the kid. It's like a head start. Yeah. It gives them a head start. Um, so here's another question. When I'm in the NICU, sometimes the neonatologist asks me what the patient has. Do I have to answer the neonatologist? Dr. Landex, that's you. This is a great question. So. Uh, we get this in our lab all the time, and we have um, probably to the displeasure of our of our team, uh, of our neonatology team, we've told our sonographers that uh, they do not need to give the diagnosis to the neonatologist. That's really the job of the cardiologist to do. And so um, it's funny because uh, I've heard neonatologists tell sonographers, you guys are like Fort Knox. You won't let anybody uh, get any information from you. And the reason for that is because we don't want to have an incorrect diagnosis that gets started or a rumor that gets started that it might be this finding or that finding. Um, we don't want to have, you know, a patient uh, started on a medication or a treatment that they may not need and vice versa. We don't want to have the attention taken off a patient who may actually have significant heart disease. So my recommendation on those type of situations would be to uh, tell the neonatologist very nicely, I'm just obtaining the images here. I'm gonna send it to the pediatric cardiologist. Um, I'd be happy to help get them on the phone with you so you guys can discuss what, what we're seeing, um, but leave it at that. And obviously, um, you know, they're not trying to push you out of your scope of practice. They're just trying to get the information for the patient as well. But this is one of those situations that uh, we feel like our pediatric cardiologist is gonna be there to protect you and there to uh, make sure that, that the right information is being conveyed to the neonatologist. So um, in this, for the sake of time, I think that's all the uh, time we have for our questions. Again, thank you, Melissa, and uh, thank you to the ASE for letting us do this talk. And with that, we're gonna hand it back over to Kat. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. We would like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar and a very special thanks to both Melissa and Dr. Landek for their time and expertise this evening. You can register for all live and on-demand webinars in the ASE Learning Hub. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.